Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 625. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 19th, 2020. All right, welcome to another program. We're so glad you tuned in to listen to us talk about all things Anglican, all things Christian, all things scary, because we're still in COVID times. And uh, George and I are going to talk a little bit about that. We also have UK news today that we'll be talking about, and uh, joy on that. Before we get too far, people have been asking, Kevin, where are you now? I'm outside Brunswick, Georgia, in a little county park. We got the RV in here uh, last night, and... This was a little scary than most because we were in places in Arizona and Utah where the cell service was a little flaky and I wasn't sure if I'd be able to record with George. We always got to show down eventually, but I'm here in Georgia on the East Coast. There should be some good cell service. We're pulling into the camp. I go from four bars, we're getting closer to the campsite, three bars, two bars. All of a sudden we come disconnected. I'm like, oh no, well, that's it's going to be a long week camping because now I have to actually take a vacation. Got to the campsite, four bars, ding, 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 and so we're able to do the live stream. Brunswick, Georgia. George, you have opened the doors of your church again post-COVID. Well, actually, we're still in the middle of COVID, aren't we? I am absolute in panic mode right now. Uh, we ran uh, four, five services, per, it, five uh, in-person services. Uh, that includes a funeral and three online services and for the in-person services excluding the funeral we're at 40 percent of average attendance i'm having a meltdown right now this is where we were when i started at this church six years ago uh i've lost everything it's, uh, <laughs> it's back where we were well uh, I, I, you gotta think about the florida demographic okay you have Martha, who's willing to go out. Martha, she's the, the regular attender. She'll go every Sunday, whether or not uh, rapture has happened, she'll be there. And Aunt Lou and Uncle Frank go once every four weeks, maybe three weeks on a, if they're feeling really well and they took their medication on time. And Lou and Frank want to know Martha's experience. Martha, is it safe? Did you feel comfortable there? Uh, were people wearing their mask? Uh, did George do the Caesar sermon? And, you know, there, there, there's always this rumor mill, with the important rumor mill at churches, is going to church normal again. And the more normal it becomes, you're going to see the 40, 45, 50, 60, 70. I don't know if you can get to 100% real quick, but I think you'll be comfortably at 80% within two or three months. Oh, but Kevin, I mean... Uh the people who came were the people who will come and hear me read the phone book. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. But they're the rumor mill, you know. Their their husbands, though, uh, and the margin. And I don't want to call them marginals, but you know, they're the the people. I gave a. I tried it. I tried. I was going to knock one out of the park yesterday, so I gave a sermon uh, on Gary Cooper and the movie Sergeant York and. This is the sort of thing that men of a certain age, this is red meat for them. It's gold, baby. I mean gold. This is the stuff that packs them in. And I had crickets because the wives were all there. And, you know, oh, isn't he a nice man? And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, so I'm scared. Uh, I'm scared. I don't, under, I don't like this time. Well, it's, un it's uncharted territory for you. I mean, you've done very well over the last you know, half dozen years to build up a working community of believers. And out of the blue, this little disease shows up and the government starts closing doors and says, you know, you're in lockdown. The church didn't know what to do. When's the last time churches were told to close their doors? Uh, you know, centuries ago. I had a funny incident. I did two burials this week. Uh, well, on Sunday, I mentioned... And I got a call earlier in the week from an undertaker in town said, one of your parishioners has died, and he gave me the name. I said, I don't recognize it. Uh, how do you know it's mine? Well, we found some bulletins in her, in her uh, apartment in an assisted living facility. Hmm. I said, well, I I'm happy to do it. And so we went down to the 
Florida National Cemetery in Bushnell, which is the giant military VA cemetery for this part of the world. And 94 year old woman, uh, and there was me, the uh, grave digger, and her three children. And I chatted with the children after the service, and they said, uh, I said, I don't re recognize your mother's name. She said, well, she moved up to the assisted living facility just down the street from our church in March from Tampa. And as soon as she moved there, the place went on lockdown. So we've not seen our mother since March. And she died under their care. She probably got the bulletins from other residents in the church who go to our church. But this poor woman essentially had been in prison the last eight months of her life in an assisted facility, you know, not able to go to church, not able to be personally see her children. She could phone them, and they could wave through at her through windows. But Florida has uh, Florida has some very good COVID uh, uh, strategy for nursing homes. Um, it's not like New York. We've had hardly any. No, seriously, we've had hardly okay. any uh, COVID deaths in nursing homes compared to the rest of the nation. Uh, but that has meant very strict guidelines. So no visitation, uh, and if somebody gets COVID, everybody's. Now, she didn't die of COVID, she died of natural causes. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's just so very sad that these lockdowns and these isolations, I'm sure they're necessary on one level, but you know, deprive someone of human company, family company, uh, religious comfort, for the closing year of her life is just a hard thing to to accept. Yeah, that's uh, you know you, you hear stories like that and you're like this this is a this is a rough time, you know. And obviously, what we're down to two weeks for the election, and uh, you you wouldn't know it if you're on Facebook. I mean, there's just pictures and funny anecdotes and stories. But uh, you know, the election's coming up. You wouldn't know it if you're on Twitter or Instagram or social media at all but there is an election between Donald Trump and uh, Senator Biden uh, if you guys care there's that coming up <laughs> well, we're, the part of the world where I live Kevin and probably the part of the world where you're driving through right now I saw my first Harris but Biden Harris sign <laughs> on a lawn the other day this is Trump territory that's going to go 70 80 percent for Donald Trump I'm exaggerating well, but no, it's, it's, it, it, there, so we, and because of that, we have no local advertising because it's not worth either that, candidates no. putting any money into this market because the outcome is certain. A blessing, a blessing in disguise. I was uh, biking on Jekyll Island uh, yesterday. It's a little island off here. Uh, it's south. a lovely place, yeah. one of the barrier islands off yep. that part of the world. Southeast of Brunswick. And the east side, no, I'm sorry, the west side of the island is going to vote for Harris the west side of the island is going to vote for trump you know this because the trump people have all their trump signs out the hair the biden people have uh voting through proxy they're announcing who they're voting for by saying i'm voting for the democratic attorney general running candidate they won't say put a biden sign out there but they're indicating by voting for a couple of Democrat local congressmen that they're also going to be voting for Biden. It's it's voting by proxy or announcing your vote by proxy. The Trump people here in Georgia uh, announce their love not by little placards in the yard, but by flags. You know, you see the flags flying from the house. You see the flags on the pickup trucks. You see the flags on businesses. Uh, we were driving by RV parks where the main office of the RV park has Trump 2020 banners and stuff coming out like wow <laughs> just like so although there are there's a lot of support here for Biden as well but they're they're announcing it by proxy one yeah. of the things that I think a lot of people, people political prognosticators are missing and I can only speak from my limited experience sure the new Hispanic middle class is solidly for Trump people who are first generations Americans from Venezuela, Cuba, South America, um, who have escaped socialist regimes. They know what it's like, and they are quite vociferous in their views on uh, on uh, social matters, yes, moral matters. So, 
Well, so we're, it's we're uh, so well, they, so the old the old American formula of Hispanics and African Americans who vote lockstep for the Democrats. I don't think it's going to hold true, or certainly there are going to be massive defections from that coalition, at least in my part. We're two weeks before the election. Four years ago, on this very day, James Comey from the FBI announced they're going to do further investigation of Hillary Clinton which probably really cost her the, the absolute loss. Uh, are we going to see something uh, where the FBI is going to investigate Biden over these, these Hunter emails? It's uh, interesting times. A I, lot can happen in two weeks. Well, well he, one of the things we've seen over the past 25 years is mm -hmm. the death of institutions. Yes. Um, universities, once upon a time, the president of Harvard University was a person of substance who could talk to presidents and who would get space in newspapers and just and the average American in the street would say, Oh, the president of Harvard, he must be a smart, wise man. Mm -hmm. That's all gone. Universities are seen as being anti anti intellectual backwaters for pampered children. And I'm not talking about the students. Um, I'm talking about the faculty. Yeah. Um, the churches. Once upon a time, churches, you know, it really made a difference if a minister or a bishop endorsed something. Mm -hmm. For mainline Protestants, that's no longer true. It may matter to Catholics, may matter in the African American churches, but if Michael Curry or whoever says something about politics, it matters not a whit. Well, that's the big and, difference. And we're, the and, but we're also saying that with the FBI. Yeah. Once upon a time, you would, we had TV shows. You, when we were young, Kevin, do you remember the FBI? Do, sorry, F. Sure. Zimbalist Jr. <laughs> where the FBI were straight-laced guys with mm -hmm. flat-top haircuts and lace-up mm -hmm. black shoes yep. and were incorruptible. Joe Friday uh, with better clothes. Mm -hmm. Now the FBI, after the Kobe years and after the current uh, director and after all this Peter Strzok nonsense, whether it's true or not, but the image of the FBI is an uncorruptible, honest organization. It's another institution that has just died and has to work very... So what I'm, where I'm going is, is if we get some bombshell, the FBI is doing X, Y, and Z, yeah, nobody's so going to believe it. it. Who, Matt, who No, It's not going to change a thing, I don't think. Hmm. It will reinforce what some people believe and what will, and other people would just deny it out of hand. No, and that's, that's the nature of the day. By now, everybody's picked who they're going to vote for and every piece of information they read on Facebook or Twitter or on the internet, where they, they go to Drudge Report, which is really gone all Biden, uh, or not, you know, it just confirms what they already believe. You're, you're at the point where all information is confirming information. And now we just wait for the two weeks to, to show up and see what uh, happens. I don't think we're gonna know the first week uh, who voted because of all the mail-in votes, and um, it'll take time. The this anxious time doesn't stop November second. Normally we'd have the the run up to November second. The anxious is there. The oh my God, who's it going to be? Oh, the world is over, and then boom, next day you know, okay, good, we're back, we're going. This is this is Gore, um, Bush, all over again. You, they're going to be a, a, a time where we don't know, and both people can claim victory. I hope we don't have hanging chads like we did before, George. That was that was Florida, you know, and that was a very anxious time for young Kevin. Well, the uh, at least in Florida, they've made great strides in election integrity, mm -hmm. and you know, there have been some problem local politicians, like the sheriff in Broward County, uh, the man who just total and the elections uh, reg uh, uh, registrar of elections in Broward County, yeah, who were basically crooks and under the last two uh, administrations the current and the previous uh, governors in Florida have done a really good job getting rid of the out and out partisans and crooks so it, it, and you see it sort of reflected in the state's uh, COVID uh, policies um, instead of just a blanket one size rule fits all um, According to the state of Florida, I can have full capacity. I can do whatever I want to do in my church. Uh, the nursing home down the street, they're still under lockdown because in their estimation, uh, that, is, that is a vulnerable population who cannot avoid contact with people. Whereas in, if you attend my church, you're an adult, you know the risks, and you make a calculated 
uh, decision, and you know, what is the risk reward ratio to attend church? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, well, I'm tipping my hand as to my preferences, but I think that's a better way to approach things than these really ineffectual centralized decision makers that say, uh, you know, the chapel at the nursing home has to be treated the same way as the thousand seat cathedral. Let's transition our news. We alluded to financial troubles over in the UK with uh, GAFCON and uh, other entities earlier this month. They wrote a nice letter saying, how oh, Anglican and Script had talked about us, please send money. That was good. Um, and then they had a follow-up letter after that mm -hmm. about a week ago mm -hmm. saying that, you know, basically upbeat, positive here where things are going and your money is going for this and that. And now what happened this week? And this week, uh, it's uh, we're closing up shop. We're doing skeleton operations, and uh, we can't afford all the things we're paying for. And what Kevin and George mentioned the other week was really, really true. And yes, George, I, it's not news I want to bring to people that you know Gafcon UK is is struggling so much uh, to bring reform onto the shores of England. And that's, that's the hardest thing. I remember sitting in the audience at the cathedral in Kenya when Peter Jensen said, listen, it's time for GAFCON to go into the shores of Britain and we're going to retake England. We're going to go in there and GAFCON is going to put up a, uh, a battlefront on the shores. And I'm like, ooh, I don't know. It's it's not that you can't do it. It's not that Justin Welby's going to you know try and stop you. It's I don't think the English know what reform is. I just don't think they they get it, want it, desire it, or know they need it. I think they think the way things are going is just fine. So what if we're down you know to two percent ASA of the whole nation? It's okay. You know as long as I get my baptisms taken care of, I get my confirmations taken care of. We can keep it accurate. Uh, assessment of who's in the cemetery that's all we need we don't need any further reform than that and that's what GAFCON was up against George and it was up against tribalism mm -hmm. uh, the cliques the factions the uh, old boy networks they would yeah. not they would not relinquish their positions of power and authority and work for the common good they would not they work together each other. right they didn't trust each other mm -hmm. So you had some people bail out. Uh, people have been bailing along the way, some to Roman Catholicism, some to independent, you know, Federation of Independent Churches, Evangelical Churches. People are, have been bailing on GAFCON UK and the whole movement because it's, it's brought into it the worst parts of the Church of England, which is the factionalism and the divisions and in the upper levels, the uh, cover your ass mindset. Um, we still don't have clear stories on Jonathan Fletcher mm -hmm. and the damage that he's done and the, the, the poison that he's injected into the evangelical world in the Church of England. And they refuse to discuss it and, they re and the leaders refuse to acknowledge it. We do, and when we do, it gets pushed down a few levels to safeguarding or, or other things rather than making a clean breast so that and then from the evangelical side they look at some of the catholic groups and they know that such and such is the closeted homosexual so how are they going to trust this guy um, they've not been able to break free of the behavior patterns that were part of the life in the church of england in this new entity and at the end of the day the people who had the money decided to starve out this uh, administrative center that was been formed. So what's left now? Well, AMIE is still there. It's going to do its thing. Melvin Tinker has uh, withdrawn from St. John's Newlands. He brought about 600 people with him. He's going to be part of uh, this, these networks in, but not of, or of, but not in. I don't know how it's going to work. Um, but it's being atomized as we come. And with the problem, you know, if you sort of step back a sec for a second, the Church of England is in no better position. <laughs> uh, they're not in a position to follow up on this chaos. 
And so from the correspondence I received, we're getting clergy basically saying, and concerned lay men and women, I don't, I basically I'm gonna roll up my shutters and just tend my own guard yeah. because these people aren't able to, I don't trust these people to lead. And that's the big, biggest difference. You know, here in America, when the ACNA formed, they had a common enemy that was vibrant. She was uh, spiritually hostile, uh, spiritually violent, and that helped to form the ACNA. Over there, they don't know what the, who their enemy is. And when you don't know who your enemy is, you become your own enemy. And... and they don't look Even at the Church the of England. They, well, they don't look at the Church of England as an enemy. Well, if, even in the House of Bishops, you've got Keith Sinclair, who was the Bishop of Berkhamsted. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the few sound voices in the House of Bishops of the Church of England. He's retiring, um, and they're going to replace him. Most like, guess my guess would be that he'll be replaced by a woman who is uh, uh, a Welbyite mush. Um, you know, it's just like this Bishop of Bishop of Reading, Olivia Graham, who did gave the pan talk, or why we're all pantheists, and has no understanding of Christian anthropology or creation or the Christian view of uh, creation mm -hmm. and revelation. Instead, she has what you know, uh, rather dry and dull uh, Greenpeace uh, theology. And that's, that's who they're going to get, because the way the institution is working is taking these mediocrities and non-entities and promoting them, and their, their first interest is not to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, not to stand for the gospel, but they render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render under Caesar the things that are God's. And that's how the Church of England's House of Bishops is working right now. Yeah. We got a report from the Episcopal Church's news service that uh, things are dire and may be completely done in 2050. Are we going to get a report from the Church of England's news service of the same type of situation there? I mean, is there a point where we just let it die and then take the shores, George? What's our advice to GAFCON? GAFCON or GAFCON UK? Or? Oh, I'm sorry, GAFCON. Well, GAFCON UK, yeah. What's our advice there? Get Keith Sinclair to take a stand. Yeah. Get, you know, Michael Nazarelli is sort of in, sort of out. Uh, there are good retired bishops who can be a voice who are not viewed with uh, suspicion. Can they not step forward now and yeah. do the things that Fitzsimmons Allison did and others of his ilk at the start of? They had retired from diocesan office, but they were instrumental in forming the new uh, Anglican entities and bringing about reform within America. The problem in England is a lack of Episcopal leadership, mm, definitely, and and too much and too much deference by lay people to the Episcopal leadership. We need more. Here I am giving advice. I love to do it, so you don't pay any attention. Well, you know, people like the listening the to lay it. People, the, yeah. the lay people need to become stronger and more demanding, mm -hmm. both in the Church of England and in GAFCON UK and AMIE. The deference to Episcopal culture needs to end. And i give you a perfect example of the unreality of Episcopal culture. Uh, the Sunday Times ran a story yesterday about who are, how poor Johnson Tama was being snubbed by not being made a life peer after he stepped down. He was a member of the House of Lords while he was Archbishop of York. He's retired. And his predecessor, David Hope, and Richard Charter, the Bishop of London, and uh, Ron Williams, right, yep. and George Carey, archbishops usually get made a, a life peer or lord upon their retirement so they can stay in the House of Bishops if they like, the House of Lords if they like. So Tama didn't get that. And so a story came out saying, why has this not been done? And bishops of the Church of England on Twitter started going, oh, this is racist. Because he's black, he's not being honored. And then immediately after these bishops started mouthing off, why are they not getting one of the perks of the job, which is a life peerage after a service well done, 
the leaders and the loudest and the strongest voices in the uh, abused and the victim community said, are you kidding? Sintam will be rewarded. He was one of the worst people in dealing with abuse. This is the man whose records of abusing priests were lost when the basement was flooded in York Palace. This is a man who refused to meet with abused victims and was physically and verbally abusive to them when they st wanted to talk to him at uh, General Synod meetings. This man has a dreadful record uh, on safeguarding issues. And if you look at it from an American perspective, well, how did he do while he was in his job? Did his diocese grow? No, it didn't. It declined. Did he achieve anything? No, he didn't. Uh, in my view, he's always been a bit of a clown. Um, see, the English have a very different, uh, they don't, they have a racist worldview. And so they have their yes, they blacks do. and other blacks. Yes. And their blacks ape their system and are not allowed to be natural people, but have to be the people whom they want them to be. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, the outrage now is that he is not being made a lord because he's black. And while at the same time they're saying, because he's black, we're going to excuse all of his multiple failings that would have had him canned years earlier. Well, I think we need to start a different BLM than George called Bishop's Lives Matter. And they need to be lords. But if if we can, if England is not going to let Samtanu be a lord, what about Justin Welby, who's guilty of the same crime? Well, before we go there, because... I agree with you, but you know, I would at the House of, at the primates meeting, Justin Welby introduced uh, Rowan Williams introduced That's bringing right. along Johnson Tomo yeah. uh, to the primates meetings, and it was a very major miscalculation. Um, I cannot read Rowan Williams' mind, but I'll I'll make a, a supposition. He wanted somebody who would be on side with the African primates, who was one of his, what his man, but in their camp. A co-communicator, you know, an emissary. The, yeah. the African primates looked at Justin uh, Johnson Tamu with utter contempt. Yeah. Utter contempt. This man was a sellout. This man was a clown. Uh, now, they didn't make statements to this effect, but, you know, just in ch private conversations sure. with him and the way they treated him, they saw this man as the token that the English are bringing to convince us to play ball with him. And, you know, English, you know, at, at his installation ceremony yesterday, Stephen Cottrell became Archbishop of York, said, we have to do things differently in the Church of England. We have to take, pay more attention to safeguarding issues and, and listen to the people. And yet this is a man, Stephen Cottrell, who when he was Bishop of Reading, the Diocese of Oxford, did an atrocious job on safeguarding. It's not we have to listen. You, Stephen Cottrell, have he, to listen. He was the poster boy of how not to do it. It's not we we need to learn our lessons. No, Stephen Cottrell, you need, need to, to learn the lessons. Yeah. And and if the Church of England is ever going to pull out of this nosedive of irrelevance, it has to shed its its image of being grossly incompetent. Um all the buzz about Justin Welby when they brought him on board to be Archbishop of York is here's a man who was uh, in the finance side of the oil industry and he knows how businesses work and all this. Well, he knows how businesses work the way the the executives of British Leyland or uh, uh, other great instances of British manufacturing capitalistic idiocy. Yes. Welby is no manager. He's no uh, businessman. He has. No, he's a. He's a corporatist. He's certainly not someone with an ounce of entrepreneurial flair that can reinvigorate a dying institution. And that's just it. You need to find. You know, Gafcon UK. You need to find your Duncan, and you need to uh, clearly identify the enemy in all this. And until you have those two. Uh, secret sauces put together for your recipe uh, you're gonna flail around and uh, my advice is to keep trying uh, England is worth it um, there well, is, let, is hard ground me, though we've talked about them many well, times well let me just change so, because I'm, I'm being very hard on Justin Welby and I 
I, I'm not being hard on the individual. I'm being hard on the man in the institutional office. Right. The decisions he's made have been hard. He's kind husband, good father, a uh, kind, be decent, intelligent man. He may have called Kevin and I shits uh, at a primates <laughs> meeting. Oh, I can't say that. Uh, or shites? I don't know how you it's, 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 it's English, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, but the... Uh, where I'm going with this is that he's he's he doesn't learn from his mistakes, and I think that and he repeats them. We now have a letter that he's gotten the other archbishops in the British Isles to sign on Brexit. Hmm. Justin Welby took a beating over Brexit when he came out against Brexit and he lent the Church support of the House of Bishops universally against Brexit whereas the majority of people in the pews in the Church of England were for Brexit. Now he's put out this letter saying, oh, it would be morally awful for us to break international law. There is no well, such thing. Justin, i got to tell you, there is no such thing as international law. There's international self-interest. And the, the British government, if it doesn't threaten and cajole, it's never going to get the deal it wants. Mm. But instead, Justin Welby has such a small-minded understanding of international relations. Uh, it, it's so bad, I feel pity for the guy, I have to tell you that. Well, I mean, he also did wonderful things. He certainly tried hard with peace uh, initiatives over his time when he was bishop, uh, before he became archbishop, and it just didn't translate well to international politics. It didn't transfer uh, well to Anglican politics. Uh, what he did as a bishop worked well as a bishop. Once he reached this higher office, uh, those things that the uh, bishop select committee in England thought were going to happen, and uh, you bring a man in who just preaches peace, 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 he didn't get it. And Well, it didn't happen when he was bishop, because remember, he was bishop of Durham for only a short time. Yeah. Ron Williams' uh, resignation was a surprise and it sort of caught the machine un, uh, unprepared mm. and so Justin Welby was kicked upstairs far far faster without being tested in the Diocese of Durham. Mm -hmm. So these the successes that you mentioned were when he was Dean of Cathedral at, at Coventry and at yeah. Liverpool. Yep. As a Bishop of Durham he was a non-entity. Yeah. Uh, he, he wasn't in the office long enough, two I, years I think. In fact that's the problem. I, I, my memory of him is pre-Bishop and so uh, it was a short time I mean, the first time we met him I think was in Ireland mm -hmm. when he went to the primates meeting not the one in Drama team but the one down in a place called Swords or right. Swords outside of Dublin mm -hmm. where he was an advisor he was one of these sort of non-entity bureaucrats that the ACC would bring in to sort of waste an afternoon on a topic of irrelevancy to the primates what a great transition. Wasted afternoon. Guys, we've done 32 minutes here of talk about uh, news around the world. We really appreciate you guys tuning in and watching us. Uh, I'm still in Georgia for a, a week. Jill, are we here for a week or two? I uh, We don't know. Yeah, she's not talking to you anymore. Ben. No, she's not. <laughs> she's busy at work as well. I, for people who don't know, my wife and I work in the same office space, which is like an 18 by 10 room where we sit here and I produce wonderful content and YouTube created content here for you guys to watch. And she's over there doing her engineering stuff with her people. And uh, uh, we we keep it quiet as possible. She's gonna have a conference call the second I hang up. And then again, next week sometime when I record, she'll stop her conference calls and I get a time to record. That's how this works. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 626. 25. So, 25. 25. That's right, yeah. Oh, uh, hey. You're right, <laughs> Anglican. <laughs> 625 of Anglican on script. That's how long the show went. We couldn't tell if it was 25 or 26. It was a long show.